problems seemed to me like it was it wasn't so much getting the right agents in, it was the, the tactics getting in the that exist. And so I'm a uh, CEO and entrepreneur and I'm actively a mentoring younger entrepreneurs And I see their business plans and, and I always look at them and think real estate is a much better industry. If you're gonna invest this kind of money to build a business, you'd be much better served in the real estate industry. So I started thinking about that, this cross-pollinization of industries and where some really neat new ideas come from. And it seemed to me that if, if we created a business entity, and an LLC is, is a vehicle that I'm familiar with, so I use that as an example, um, the, the agents building a business can get investment, whether it's from friends and family, whether it's from the broker, whether wherever it's from, into this business and run it like a business. And as I started inspecting more, you know, I'd see all of these sharp business people in their 30s and 40s after they've saved money, they want to become business owners, buy subway franchises. It just killed me. Then I talked to some uh, agents that have really taken to building businesses, and they're doing two, three, two million, three million, four million dollar gross commission. And I mean, it seemed to me that those are the kind of people that we need to bring into the industry. But the problem is, how do we attract them? It's sort of like we're getting them by hit and miss right now. How do we build a system that attracts those people and lets them flourish? So in a nutshell, that's what it is. It's something to discuss. So to specifically talk about sort of the, the investment model and what happened, you know, go into it a little bit in depth, because I think that that's the, the somewhat challenging or unorthodox dimension of what you put forth. Okay, so um, for the investment, as we all know, the startups are the rage. Everybody wants to be an entrepreneur and a CEO. And um, I think one of the articles I mentioned that a real estate salesperson was the number 74th most respected position uh, US Consumer and World Report. So if you're going to build a business, and you build, you start with an LLC, that gives you an investment vehicle. So people can own shares inside of the LLC. Again, friends and family, so your parents, their the agent's parents can invest, their friends can invest, and they own part of the company. And they have an interest in their success, but they'll also make a profit if the company is successful. As a broker, you end up spending, I don't know, it varies between every broker, I'm sure, but there's a lot of money and time, so, in kind investment into an agent. And many of those agents go out of business, so that investment is lost. Um, and that's okay, they, they're going to go out of business. But the one that really gets me is you invest and you train agents and you give them systems and they're super successful and then the broker down the road offers them a better commission to come in and work for them. Well, that's not gonna go away. We have free agency, right? But, um, but if it's an LLC, then all they're doing is, is switching the business's wholesale provider. And you as a broker, if you own 20% of that business, and say you're a global banker um, affiliate or franchise, um, and they go down the street to you know, Remax, you're still going to be paid from the profit that business makes. You no longer have the, the separate line of business of providing services to that company, but as an owner in that company, when it makes a profit, you still get paid. And then what's been taken, uh, it wasn't, wasn't so much my idea, is the idea that you've got a business that has value and can be sold. And so when that business is sold, whether it's retirement or someone gets tired of, the business, of being in real estate, as a broker or an investor, you're going to see some return on your investment from that sale. Okay, so having put that out there to consider. I'll ask Debbie, who you work with some of the most productive teams in the country. So the notion that you, know, you or first team, would invest in one of these highly productive agent teams, only have them walk away, if you still have peace, how does that strike you? Well, that rarely happens. Don't mind. Um, it happens all the time, right? And the part that intrigues me the most about this model is the fact that we could potentially put the golden handcuffs on them, which I really like. 
I love the idea of being able to tie them to us and then not let them walk away from us, right? All the brokers in the room. If you're a broker, raise your hand. Do you love that? Yeah, me too. So if we have an opportunity to do that, that would be really great. But we, we already expend so much money into these agents. I think that they would be hard pressed to recognize that we only would get 20% of that business when they take a look at how much we actually do bring to the table. But in your model, 80-20 applies, then we certainly do have a, a, a proposition of being able to own potentially more of their business than 20%, which I also agree with. So how do you how do you see that placing golden handcuffs on on the on the agent or the team? You know, because I think your notion is inherently you know, supportive of this sort of portability. Agents can bounce around, right? So you said mine is supporting it. Mine is just acknowledging that it's there and making the most of a, a suboptimal. So can I can I chime in? Yeah, please. I, my question would be is what what's golden about those handcuffs? What's in it for the agent or the agent team that is giving this piece to the brokerage? I mean, they, really, there's nothing in it for them to give that piece away. Well, they're already giving it away. Well, they're giving it away, but not perpetuity. Right, that's why I like about it. But, <laughs> but, but that's an agent. Why would an agent like that? I, I can't see an agent ever liking that. And I, I, think the, I think the fundamental problem here is that the, the discussion around brokerages and brokerage retention is always about, well, I'm afraid that they're going to leave. Well, you're afraid that they're going to leave because you're not providing enough value or differentiation compared to your competitors. <laughs> and if you're really providing value as brokerage, you don't need golden handcuffs to keep them. Yes, you're going to lose some along the way. The grass is always greener. But by and large, you will retain them if you're providing actual value. Have you ever lost an agent where you said, damn it? Uh, yeah. OK, well, I mean, maybe if you would, you know, put some seed money into their business when they started up, yeah. maybe you'd still be getting a dividend check. <laughs> well, then, uh, our, our model is very different. Our model is very different, probably from anybody in the room. It, it, so explain your model. So our model, all of our agents are actually employees of the company. Um, they come, you know, being an employee comes with benefits and expectations. Um, there, there's a salary component. There's also a bonus component, which is based on how many houses they sell and how many houses the team sells. So there's both keep them motivated both on an individual basis, but they're also motivated to help out uh, their coworkers. And we provide basically all of their business expenses. Uh, you know, whether it's training, mileage reimbursement, marketing, our job, or at least from my perspective, our job as a brokerage is to provide the tools and the environment for them to work with as many clients as possible and to spend as little time and effort on all the mundane stuff that doesn't actually any business. So our model is different. Our retention model is different. Um, you know, I lost somebody that actually went into a different industry who was a great agent. Uh, we will lose a big agent at some point that will really upset us. I mean, that's the nature of the beast. But so at the risk of, of being too ad adversarial, <laughs> you own 100% of their business. Yes. Right? Yep. Yes. <laughs> I say yes and no. So he is really good. <laughs> I'm going to disagree with that. I mean, there, there is a certain percentage of, the, of our former clients who would associate with the brand and the brokerage, and we will probably retain them. If an agent, a highly productive agent, goes to another brokerage, am I going to lose their referral business? Most likely, yes. There is nothing in my power that I can do. If, if they're if their clients love them, I cannot retain that business as much as I would like to. If they go and do something else in a different industry, then, you know, chances are very good that we will retain that business. But I don't have your structure would put a, a hook into that that says you can't have these, or or you can have these, but I still get a piece five years down the line. That's that's I think where the rub is. So, Debbie, get way in. Well, I'd like to ask a question of Brian, if I could. So, so Brian, Kevin, I'm sorry, Kevin, you're right. You and I are brothers, right? So we, we, we're the ones who are the agents. At the um, at the risk of being confrontational, 
how many agents do you really think want to be entrepreneurs? Really want to be entrepreneurs? Because I think they have completely different characteristics than the top 20% who are doing 90% of the business. I, I, I would agree. You know, in our market, uh, we're in Seattle, there's probably 10,000-ish agents in our city. Um, are there 10,000 entrepreneurs who want to start 10,000 LLCs who want to print up 10,000 different business cards who want to do 10,000 different websites? That, that just doesn't make sense for a whole lot of the reasons. And I think there's a huge segment of the agent population out there that wants to just be an agent and doesn't want the overhead of trying to run a business. And you know, some of them participate in teams, some of them struggle on their own. Um, and you know, I don't think. I think there's a huge swath of the agent population that, that would not go for the, the plan just for that reason. So, so let, me, let me jump in. So the idea isn't to say that there's one way to do it, another way to do it, it's to bring in opportunity. So um, I think Kevin's a great example because Kevin is sells real estate and he's hired a bunch of people to work for him to sell real estate. So he's an entrepreneur that has a business model and has employees that he is not under another broker but what he's doing is what I'm kind of suggesting that you can have make, make it easier for someone to start a business because I'm going to guess that when you started your business it was expensive you had all sorts of expenses and you had no brand but if you started your business and I'm not saying you should because they're, you know, you've got the, the reason that you're you know, but if you if you could have started underneath a global banker underneath a century program, underneath a window here, then your expenses to start would have been substantially lower. You could still hire your agents that you have and make a profit. That's the model that I'm talking about. And it's not going to be right for everyone, but you can attract that kind of person with this model that you wouldn't be able to because, I mean, yes, you just weren't going to be an agent and stay an agent in a brokerage for the rest of your life, right? Correct. Correct trying to build something bigger in a plan that's recognizable in our market. So I'll just say, if anybody has a question at any time, I want to get you know people involved here, just raise your hand. So I see Bill here. Uh, I think I missed something on this part where you said that the broker oh Bill Platt is first in real estate. Um, you said that the program is it's an LIC and you invest in that person, is that correct? So you have the option to invest in that person. So I mean, everyone who walks through the door with the investment, and then the investment could be cash or in kind. So when you provide their business cards and their office space and whatever you're paying for, instead of just providing them with no dollar figure, you say this is a $5,000 package that I'm going to invest in your business, and for that you're going to give me this many shares of your business. Okay, so basically you're giving them money. Uh, you can't. It, it, it's an option. Well, let's say you don't give them money. So you start an LLC. We're going to do that now. You start an LLC. Everybody comes to come to brand new. We don't give them money. We give a piece of them for the rest of their life. I'll, I got two thousand of them. I love to do that. But why would they? Why would they do it? So in fact, they wanted to do it. I wouldn't hire them. <laughs> <laughs> for value, they're not people that are going to be salespeople. A, a salesperson right. that would not be the right model. A person that wants to build a business. That's the person. The person that was gonna was gonna buy a subway franchise. So business experience, go getting, wants to be their own boss. You're essentially providing a competing, uh, a competing product system to compete with subway and all these other franchises. And what I think is a much better business. Well, but the one that comes in there first of all, I said is to hire a tons of agents. So more. Um, you're hiring somebody, first of all, that should have some money. I always would like to have six months in income. Then normally they borrow or they aspire or they borrow it and I give you a thousand stories. Yeah. And so they come in with a plan, I have to put a plan together. You mentioned plan. It all depends on the broker you're going to. A good broker is your partner, even though they're not crazy enough to give you a bunch of money so you and they hope you make it. They're going to give you training in a partnership. We're actually that crazy. I keep going. <laughs> you know what I mean? God bless you that you've done it. And you're one of the rare people that I've heard it's done it. I've heard people try it. 
but and, and maybe the model isn't that way. But somebody started the model many years ago and said, I can, I can get 100 people in there, it doesn't cost me anything. Then they find all later on, it costs me a hell of a lot. But and we get into the model and we throw a bunch of people in the wall and what makes it. And so I don't mind somebody sitting around trying to figure out that model. But the models do change from company to company and broker to broker dramatically. Some of them run very efficient business. We have managers that run extremely efficient business. You know, they're going to spend two hours, they'll spend 15 minutes with you or two hours. 15 minutes, you're out the door in the nicest way possible. Two hours, they're going to get you with a kind of a plan together where the money is. So in theory, they're doing what you say, but the difference is Subway's got a thousand of them, they got a plan, they know what, what street they're going to put on it. And it, it really is a different entrepreneur friendship. Uh, and, and, and that person who goes into that Subway probably is working there and has got a lot of risks when I'm going to put those sandwiches out. We would like to have people doing the same thing, knock on doors or do something with a risk. Yes. Actually, it's more of a statement than a question, and then came a little late, so I'm sorry if it was addressed. I think there's a whole bunch of brand new agents. I read recently that agents who were in the broker that or agents who were at, still rated at like 79, and I think that these agents are out there, and I think that there was a way that we could engage them by helping them financially. You get a whole bunch of really well-educated agents who want to come into our industry that can't come into our industry right now because of our present market. So, um, and, and that's a great point. These are all great points. And let me be clear. I don't have a model. I'm saying here is an opportunity. This LLC lets you do a lot of creative things. It lets you recruit people who don't want to be real estate salespeople, they want to own a business, and let, it, it gives them a model to own a business. Whether you invest in it or not is up to you. I mean, you may have some rock star that you know is going to be successful, and you say, I want to invest, just like somebody invested in Google, and somebody invested in Zillow, and somebody, I mean, that's, I'm trying to look at those models, and I can see where they fit. Now, as an angel investor, you know, not even one percent of the businesses that come come out for investment get investment. So you do have to be critical. You're not going to invest in every person, but you, you're also going to help them with <coughs> with building systems. And each one's going to be unique. And that's why I say this is this is something for discussion because I certainly am not going to come up with an answer that works for everyone. But I think that it's a it's it's a it's a way of of. It's a tool that can be used to solve problems. So I want to uh, just to interject because I, if I understood your thesis correctly, the, the focus really isn't, hey, listen, we're going to open up a brokerage and we're going to hire other people to do this. The, the focus really was on this notion of the agent team, which talking with lots of brokers, there's, there's a certain level of anxiety over this trend. So I have somebody in my brokerage with four or five buyers agents, their own transaction coordinators, their own marketing person, and they're generating their own leads, they're doing all this stuff, and I can't hang on to them. So I think you're talking about, tell me if I'm wrong, sort of a specific case that is is, is, is a pain point for some brokers. Is that? Uh, it, it is. I, I know I'm beating beating here with, with saying this isn't the answer to all things, but it's very important to remember that the teams, I've seen some teams that are so successful that they're not the teams of, of a group of equals. They are hierarchies. They're, they are a leader who pays salaries and bonuses to members of a team. And I believe that that's going to be the future of real estate. That's where the success is going to be. So I've seen companies and brokerages that fight teams, and of course, you know, a team will come into an existing commission structure that was not designed for teams, and they blow it apart. And it's, it's not good for brokerages. But rather than saying no teams, fix the structure. Build a structure that supports teams. I think that's the essence of my, my thesis is build a structure that supports these small businesses and lets them thrive inside of your brokerage. And so there are going to be a hundred different ways of, of doing that. I couldn't even guess at 10 of them. But that's the, the thought is, is I, I really believe that the, the time of one deal, two deals a year, 
throw against the wall, see if they, they stick, that that time has passed, and it'll take us five or 10 more years as an industry to flush that out. But the new direction is gonna be these low, you know, smaller teams. And excuse me, Brian, that's what I really like about this, is that those big teams, and that, that is who is controlling a lot of the 20% the now, they're big, they're really big teams. Some of them are doing you know, hundreds of millions of dollars a year in volume. And they, they have, that's the guy that I want to put handcuffs on, because he's already got everything going on. And it's really easy for them to take their business, because it's already pretty much self-contained, and walk it wherever he wants to go. So that's one of the things I really like about this. But I'd like to make two points. One of them is, we keep talking about bringing in younger people and, and making them entrepreneurs. Our business is full of entrepreneurs. That's what we tell them to be. And I think most of the brokers here would, would say that that's what we tell our agents when we bring them in as new agents. You're an entrepreneur now. You own your own business, et cetera. And that's how we build them. But it, this isn't about age, because it, it doesn't matter what business you're in, it still takes 10,000 hours to be a master. And if the average age of our population today is 40 plus, 50 plus in some areas, that's because it's taken that long to become a master of this business. A brand new agent still requires the apprenticeship. And while it may not be hard to get into our business, the apprenticeship is very hard. And getting the mastery is not easy. And that's why they need a brokerage. To, to, to get going. I think that that's the most important role that we play in this, but if we can figure a model that then keeps that with us once we build that, oh, that would be good. Do you have an apprenticeship program like you were just We do. And what does it involve? Like if I'm a brand new agent, never been in the business, what does first team do for me? Ah, we're masters of this. So one of the things that we do is we, we put you with some um, three weeks of training. Uh, with some masters in our company because because we're called first team. Team's what we do. And we have some of the best of the best in our company that share their best practices with our brand new agents. Then they have mentors within the offices. In, in um, the luxury offices, for example, they have to do three transactions with the mentor and, and continuing uh, weekly training to be sure that they are competent because they're using our brand out there. And I want to be sure that they're not undervaluing our brand in any way. Uh, we have a question here from the audience. So, thank you. My name is Bill Loveland, and I'm uh, CEO of Century 21 Advantage Gold in Philly. And I uh, hate the words lean in and uh, entrepreneurial. Um, the question was asked earlier, uh, you know, how many entrepreneurs would there be in a group of 10,000 agents? And then 10 minutes later, one of you said, we tell all of our agents they're entrepreneurial. I think both of those are true statements. But I did want to ask a question of the gentleman in the middle, who is Kevin O'Brien. Whichever. Whichever. I'm trying to tie. And the idea. So the question I have for you is, if I buy a Subway franchise, I understand what my job is. My job is to hire kids who can count to six so they can put the correct number of turkey slices on the half roll and the rest of that stuff. In this world, you said you don't want to hire a salesperson. To, this thing got like really corkscrew, but I'm not that bright. I'm a real estate broker. So I'm just trying to figure out what was going on with it. So you didn't want a salesperson to be the business person, right? Am I correct or no? Or no? no. What I was saying is when you're going out and recruiting salespeople, right. being a salesperson 30 years ago, 40 years ago, was fine, was, was great. Now, the thing that kids want to be are business owners, CEOs, okay. entrepreneurs. Okay, so when I say kids, I'm, I'm no, also- that's fine. That's, that's, everybody's a kid. 30 somethings are young. Yeah, it's fine. fine. She's a kid, too. So, it's all good. Right? <laughs> Teresa Borgman, my kid. So anyway, um, so the question I have for you is, so we hired this kid, whatever age, 50, 60, 40, 30, doesn't matter. We hire this person. What in God's name is their job? Are they to recruit, hire, train, and retain agents? Because I call that a manager or an owner. Or do they have some other job? And that's up to you. Oh. <laughs> no, it is. That's so <laughs> what, what I'm, I'm just not that right. What I'm, all I'm promoting. So they can be anything. 
Yeah, so all, all, I'm, all, I'm, all I'm suggesting is there is a difficulty in recruiting new people to the industry. The industry is aging really fast. We're at the CEO summit, and the topic across the board was recruiting and recruiting quality people. And so in trying to solve that, it's like, well, should we do the same thing we've been doing for the last 20 years? And I've been in the real estate industry since 84, so I've watched a lot of what's gone on. And there hasn't been a change in, really, in recruiting, but the rest of the world has changed. So should we try a, the same thing, or is there another thing we can do? It doesn't mean throw the other stuff can out. I, can I make thing. another suggestion to you? Sure. How about instead of trying to codify this, where all the questions seem to end up with, it's up to you. It's up to you whether you invest money in them or not. It's up to you what the percentage is. I understand it. How about if you attempt to recruit people by creating a career path to allow them to grow beyond sales? Whatever that means. It could mean growing into management. It could mean growing into equity positions. But this is, um, as iconoclastic kind of as it may sound, that's actually not new. It's just that like, there were like a lot of brokers in the room, right? Yeah. Like nobody wants to, many of us do not want to give up any portion of ownership. Or are we willing to give up some portion of ownership of the mothership? That might be more attractive to recruiting young entrepreneurial types who can then, instead of allowing us to own some small thing they built, they could then own some portion of the larger thing that we built together. Just an idea. So that, that's an idea. Another idea that, not my idea, but someone. Yeah, that, I know. Uh, there's an empty chair. They, no, no, no. What they, it's, it's they're getting. No, I guess a lot. This is very interesting. They're getting the retirement payments to put their businesses into an LLC, share ownership, retire, and continue getting revenue from it. And then you, as a broker, have an asset that you might be able to put into a young hotshots business. Or brokers, you can do all sorts of things. You have a room full of brokers that don't feel comfortable retiring and having their asset make money for them and they don't <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I probably believe that I'm going to hire someone who is that much smarter than I am. He should be hiring me. So, why don't we just come start talking about over and over? We've got to move this along so I'm going I've hired two people right out of uh, university. They didn't have the money. They are very bright. I hired, at the same time, a uh, senior executive who was just retiring from American Express. He's now out of the business. I invested about $15,000 each into the new people I hired. They paid me that back in two months. And uh, the loyalty I've gotten from that has been exceptional. So it was a, what, I get what you're saying. There's different types of investment. You just have to look at how you're going to structure it, whether it be an employee or whether it be uh, you're investing in their business. But there are different ways of going about it. Because for 25 years, I've looked at it as, here, I'm just going to recruit someone who's going to go and sell. But I want someone who's going to be smart about their business, build relationships, be around, to put into my business. Thanks. So I'm going to agree 100% with what he had to say. And I think one of, the, one of the ways that we've tried to attract people to our brokerage is to recruit people that they're either, maybe they're very young, they're uh, inexperienced, they don't have the sphere necessary to really get going as a real estate broker. Uh, we've hired people out of title companies or lenders that are in a kind of a related business but haven't done the brokerage work. It's the hard path that the vast majority of brokerages out there will not take, which is to invest in them give them the financial support that they need to get going, give them the leads, give them the training, give them the mentorship, and the loyalty does come when you do that. Plus, you get people that are trained in the way that you want them to do business. Uh, and I think that's, you know, I, all too often I think the recruitment question is, well, how do you recruit these top producers from my competitor down the street? You can build your own top producers in house, it's just a lot of work. Um, hi, my name is Rich Ricker. I'm the uh, president of Built Executives International. I also work at Sec Cap, owning a brokerage in Phoenix, with about 800 people. Uh, my father started the 100% commission concept back in 1965, so this is not a new discussion. This goes back 40 some years. And we've solved the problem a couple ways. Um, but I'm hearing two things I'm hearing recruitment, I'm hearing retention. 
and that's what this is all about, right? But just to give you a quick snapshot, we, um, as a broker, uh, we come up with what we call a satellite office situation where I don't have any investment in the overhead in the physical plant, but I retain people that way that have teams that are able to to uh, work their own uh, style of independent contractors. Uh, as a franchisor, we have something called the single point franchise. It has certain uh, ways of, of, of offering somebody an asset, some way to build their business. And anyway, just wanted to share that there are some other ideas out there that have been in existence for some time that, that really do this. And I guess, um, you know, the point is, we're, we're all facing the same thing when it comes to overhead, when it comes to, you know, how, how to, and every real estate company is the same in terms of dealing with how do you deal with expenses, how do you pay your, your people to be productive. And we all answer that differently. So, let me just go back to this question. Somebody said earlier, you know, and it, it sounds common sense to call it a little bit glib that, you know, you don't have to worry about agents leaving if you deliver value. Okay, yeah, we get it. Um, but I want to ask you, uh, and I'll start with Debbie, like, how do you keep these power teams with you? I mean, what, what is the, the, the secret sauce of value within your organization? I can tell you that I have to kill you. Yeah. <laughs> well, just keep it between us. Right. <laughs> Look, value is the next thing. You have to be innovative. You've got to be able to, you've got to come here, and you've got to be able to bring back the latest, greatest, whatever's going on there. But bottom line is, I think that you've got to care and be authentic with them about growing their business. And if you put them first, I found tremendous loyalty uh, from, from the top teams. And I think it's all about how you and your company position yourselves with them. If it's truly a partnership and they feel this is really a partnership and wow, they care about my growth and they've built me to here and they're part of my business, then I think that you have a very good chance of a retaining that will not Do you lose teams once in a while? Sure, everybody does. You know, the grass is always greener somewhere for somebody. 100% is, is not possible, but the, the truth of the matter is that authenticity in my view and that putting them first and, and creating a value, it does really come down to that, is what keeps them. Sir, do you have a question? Uh, actually, yeah. Uh, it's a statement and maybe a follow-up question, but so I'm the president of Realty National. We have four offices, so this is very interesting to me because I'm actually in the process of uh, putting de uh, developing a franchise, basically, and we're going to franchise Realty National eventually within a year or so. So there's a lot of ideas that I like and the models that you guys are bringing to the table. And just to kind of give you a snapshot of what I'm creating in my vision, and I think it will make sense to all these points, is Real estate is just a product, in my opinion, that we use in the sense to make money. However, I want to, I'm creating a company that's, that agents want to be part of, not just because of real estate, but it's more of the culture, uh, the growth uh, from a business standpoint, from personal growth, uh, and then focus my energy on team growth. So, I'll give you an example, I have an agent right now, and I, I see she wants to be an entrepreneur, but no agents look at themselves that way on the beginning. So it's up to us to seek out those type of individuals within our brokerage and raise them to be an entrepreneur and then help them build their team, okay? I think the industry is backwards where the broker owners are actually afraid of their, their own teams because they've been created on their own without much support from the actual broker because the broker is afraid that the team, if I help them too much, they're gonna actually leave and create their own company. Where in my opinion, if I'm gonna actually help them create the team and then solve the issue that you had on hand, where hey, how do I get these new agents to join my company and what hope that they make it, which I hate that that, that whole model. How about I take those new agents and I team them up with somebody like Risha who wants to be a team leader and help those agents create that team together within my company and then tie them all together by actually masterminding with all those teams and create growth and push reading personal books, go, go to coaching. That's what, I'm, that's what my company is about. So I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, so I mean, do you want to, let me, let me, so I, I, I take what you're saying. I mean, basically you're, you're circling around the same point of view, which is 
to, to help them build their business from the beginning and become a partner with them. Uh, so, so, so I get that, but Kevin, I mean, so your, your value is basically, I'm going to provide you with a paycheck every two weeks and take some of this stuff that's not related to selling real estate off the table. I mean, that's <laughs> that's correct. And I mean, our model is to, as somebody that sells more real estate and is more experienced, the, the salary portion goes down because you know the agents can take on that risk and you can give them more upside than, than when they're just starting out. But I want to take I want to take the stuff off the table that is not transacting real estate. I, transacting real estate is what's the fun part of this job. It's, it's not creating websites. It's not uh, you know, it's not sending out postcards, it's not um, printing out uh, flyers and all this other stuff. If I can provide an infrastructure to do that, I think that's a tremendous value. I think that there's a brand that a brokerage can provide that is very difficult to replicate on a smaller level. Um, and, you know, it's certainly technology and, um, and infrastructure that, uh, you know, I think the good brokerages, the ones that retain the agents, are the ones that will have those sort of systems in place. Got it. So, uh, I have a question here. Briefly, we have a question for Debbie. Debbie, can you just explain in your mentoring program, do the agents that you ask to be mentors, do they expect payment? Do they understand it's part of the system? Do they, you know, obviously there's some agents that maybe don't support your mortgage or title and you don't want that to mentor. Can you just talk about the, the obligations of the agent and the expectations of the agents that are mentors, not mentees? Absolutely. Um, so, the agents that are the mentors, not the people that are being mentored, uh, receive, we've got two models. One of them is a complete compensation model where they're an uh, employee and their responsibility is to mentor new agents. And we call them BDMs, uh, business development managers. And our career path for them is, hey, we think you're really great. We think you're management material. So show me you're a great manager. I'm gonna pay you a salary, a little salary here. You go ahead and, and you mentor these people and show me how you build agents. That's one way. We have another model where um, we have top agents who really do have training and coaching as part of their background. They're not just top agents, because top agents don't do a great job mentoring. Um, one of them, for example, uh, is uh, also Tony Robbins trainer, so she's really a coach, right? And she retains a, a small percentage, 25% of the agent's first three commissions as payment. She builds people because that's what she wants to do. It's not for the money. Okay, uh, we're going to take one more question from this gentleman here, and uh, I mean, we need to kind of wrap it up, but okay, one more question here. Thank you. Um, I want to go back to what you just commented about um, the, uh, the branding and some of the smaller brokers, the smaller brokers just can't really do that. Completely false. Um, I think small companies are the backbone of America in general. A lot of boutique brokerages are out there, and we're actually making more and more strides into the market share of the bigger companies. We are more nimble. We can do their things immediately. And quite frankly, I've been open since November as a broker owner. And I know a lot of people in here right now, they know Orange is Unit Realty Group in downtown Boston. Um, I can walk down the street and be like, oh, Unit Realty Group, I saw that in a car over on the other side of town. My brand has actually impacted my market already, and downtown Boston is not easy to do, and we've done it. So I really do think that people need to pay attention to the fact that small brokerages can do just as well as the big guys. We have the internet, we have the infrastructure, we have the virtual office, the brick and mortar. We're the same, we're on the same playing field now. So, and my five agents love me. Love the fact that we give them what we give them. We're there for them. I'm a trainer, I train them, I have school opening soon. So, do you give them leads? I do give them leads from our website as well as some different mailers and marketing that we do. We work with Smart Home Price, so we bring them all in, buyer, seller, rentals, you name it, we have it. Okay, so um, we could probably discuss this one for a long time, but what I, I would say, just to kind of wrap it up, is, so I've, I've been around this business for a long time, and you know, all of you, operating this business and what what I always appreciate is an idea that is something we haven't really heard before or maybe something that sounds a little bit odd to us or we can't quite get our mind around it first. So I want to thank you, Renway, first of all, for just throwing it out there. I don't think, you know, as a tech vendor you really have a dog in the fight. But um, you know, putting it out there is, is 
food for thought, right? Um, so thank you also, Kevin, and thank you, uh, Debbie. I appreciate it. So let's give everybody a round of applause.